AI is getting really crazy, really fast. There's so much being released that most of us just can't keep up with what's going on. First of all, there's an insane amount of money being raised for AI. CoreWeave, an AI cloud computing startup backed by NVIDIA, just raised a whopping $7.5 billion with a B. And hundreds of smaller startups are raising millions. Elon Musk just raised $6 billion for the Gigafactory of Compute that he's building to power his AI chatbot. And it's been confirmed that Apple has signed an agreement with OpenAI to provide iOS 18 with ChatGPT functionality, which will probably be announced in their June announcement. From AI music generators to banking and legal assistance, everyone is going millions, even billions in debt for their next big app ideas. And like I've been saying for a while now, many of these, they're just proof of concept apps, displaying the next big thing that can be done with AI. Some will fail and others will be iterated on to become better, more mature concepts. And the big reason why many will remain merely proof of concepts for the time being is trust. When it comes to pure data, AI excels. Mathematical operations, data retrieval, searching, answering, processing, all of that, AI does great. But the problem I have, and the problem I think many companies have with adopting AI currently, is when that data is transferred over to human decision making. Can we really base a hundred million dollar decision on the data that AI has presented to us? Did we ask the right questions? To be sure, let's go back and do the calculations ourselves to see. Well, then isn't that double the work? And if it's way off, then it's been a complete waste of time. AI can do the calculation, no question. But perhaps we're not asking the right questions. Could it perhaps skew or misunderstand the minute details of what we're asking such that we can't fully trust it to work on its own? unsupervised in our company's environment? And if it needs to be supervised, then that creates more work. And if it creates more work than a human being doing it, then what's the point? Now, the truth is AI can 100% replace legal assistants or paralegals, bank tellers, accountants, no question about that. It's there, it can do the work. It can import the knowledge and make sense of it when we prompt it. In fact, a brand new study just came out a few days ago stating that LLMs can perform analysis on financial statements better than professional analysts. But again, the big issue is trust. Can I trust AI for legal advice that may lead me to making the right or possibly gravely wrong decision? Do we trust an AI bank teller with a bank full of money or with our money? Do we trust an AI accountant to handle a company's funds? Well, we don't. And in best case scenario, we need to work alongside of AI, which is where we're at currently. And this situation provides businesses with the most benefit as we speak. In fact, there are many such use cases being adopted by businesses, big and small. We just finished a book together in the Travis Media community called The Business Case for AI, which was an excellent look at best practices in practical real world use cases that companies are actually using already. And then companies who are on the fence about AI can slowly start to introduce. If you haven't joined the community, what are you even doing? We have weekly live events, coding challenges, book reading, a community chat. I'd love for you to join. I'll put a link below if that interests you. Now, of course, this will inevitably lead to a loss of jobs. But as I keep saying, all of this new technology will create jobs that we haven't even conceived of yet. That's what history has taught us. And we need to now be on the lookout for these new opportunities. Now's not the time to hunker down and complain about everything. Now's the time to be more alive in your career than ever. And being primarily problem solvers, technicians and people who love to learn over against being a coder will go a long way. Wherever you're at on your journey, you're on a good path for all of this upcoming technology. Just keep honing in on your soft skills, your problem solving skills, and your logical thinking. And a fun and interactive way to hone and grow these problem solving skills and logic related skills is with today's sponsor, Brilliant. Brilliant.org is a great way to learn math, logic, and computer science interactively. Brilliant is fun, practical, and has thousands of lessons from basic to advanced topics from computer science and programming, algorithms, Python, AI, logic, and other tools to help you level up your skills or keep those skills sharp. And it's built for busy people like me and you. Like I said, you can master big concepts in as little as 15 minutes a day. Maybe you want to dive deeper into large language models, neural networks, big data, or just learning the basics of Python, building programs on day one with the built-in drag and drop editor. Today, I started learning about neural networks, specifically artificial neural networks, which is one approach to creating artificial intelligence and creating the ability to learn to identify people in images, play chess, and even help doctors make medical diagnoses. And like I said, 
Brilliant can help you solidify those AI, logic, and coding skills and concepts that apply across different fields. And to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash travismedia or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription. Now back to the video. So anyway, all that being said, AI has presented us with some great tools to date. Useful tools that you'll need to utilize to stay ahead. And you'll have to choose your flavor of these tools. For example, I don't really use Microsoft apps, so their Copilot isn't really any use to me. I'm not going to now go and start migrating all of my things over to Microsoft just to try out their AI. In addition, Google's Gemini, it's still not there. The latest is that it's telling us to put non-toxic glue on a pizza to make the cheese stick better. And what are some fruits that end with um? Applum, bananum, strawberum, tomatum, and coconut. Hey, at least coconut's right. And this comes after the image generator launch that had serious issues with political correctness over basic history. Well, I don't need it to do a web search for me yet. There may come a day, but I don't need it yet. But there are two tools that I think are useful for many of us. And yes, they're boring compared to all of the fresh and new innovation out there, but they just work. First, ChatGPT is not new at all. It's been out for a while, many people use it, but personally, I love it. I use it all the time. Not really for my coding, but for everything else, I use it a lot. It doesn't require me to join some other ecosystem of tools that I normally wouldn't use to use it. But not only did they just announce their GPT-4.0, which has been pretty amazing based on my usage of it, but they also released the desktop version. Now this may sound petty, but the key here is that it makes ChatGPT a click away at all times. So what I can do now is I have a hotkey, I can hit option space, and I get a GPT prompt. And while you guys are having it tell you bedtime stories, others have found myriads of use cases for it to exponentially speed up their workflows. For example, I had an app a while back and I wrote the code and I wanted a good amount of particular data to be returned from a JSON call and so I typed it all out. Now first of all, I shouldn't have typed it all out. I should have gave GPT the field names and had it do the work for me. It's really good at this sort of stuff. But then I noticed in the documentation that it was actually using form data. So I needed to switch formats because form data is different and it would take an unnecessary and petty amount of time to change that JSON to form data, but not with GPT. I can literally paste in the code and tell it to change it to form data. Sure, I may have to tweak a couple things in the end, but overall it saved me a good 10 minutes. And like I said, GPT is really superb for these cases. Some sort of menial work like converting code or converting text, just feed in what you need and have it do the work for you. So having this desktop app literally a click away, it's very similar to Spotlight or Raycast or something like that, has been a game changer for me. Now second, they've actually brought data analysis into GPT. In a way that almost turns it into a Jupyter Notebook. No, it's not the same, but it's getting there. Check this out. So I grabbed this data set off of Kaggle. It's the Stack Overflow 2023 survey data. And I actually deleted all but 10,000 rows just to save time and file size and all of that. But check this out. I can actually upload the data set. So I can click here. And actually one of the new announcements was that you can connect to Google Drive or Microsoft OneDrive and just pull your data set from there if you want. But anyway, I can upload from my computer, grab this data set, and load that into my chat window. And it starts analyzing this data set. And I don't really care about this information right here. I care more about this interactive table here. So I can expand this, make this bigger, and I can look at all of the rows, all of the columns, whatever I need to do. But the cool thing is I can now work on this data interactively. So say I take the ages of this survey, I just click the age column and see right here, it says age column. And I say, give me a pie graph of these ages. And look at this, I now have a pie graph telling me how many people are what ages in this data set. And the cool thing is it's interactive. So here I could switch to a static chart if I wanted to, and I could print it or download it. I could go back to the interactive chart. I could change the colors for the different age groups. And then I could also expand it and work around this. I could say, okay, now that we have this graph, do something else. It's pretty neat. But here I'm gonna go back up and I'm actually gonna make this bigger so I can work around this. And I'm gonna say something like, uh, show me the average years code. So that's a column name for each dev type. So if I scroll right, you'll see this years code column in this dev type column. I wanna know the average years of coding per dev type or dev role. So I can ask it that and it'll do the analysis for me. And it's not just gonna tell me, it's gonna tell me, but it's gonna give me some kind of chart to work with. And there it is. Now I can do something like select the year's code column and say, update this column with rounded numbers instead of decimals. 
and it updates my chart. And then maybe I want to go back. Let me open up my main chart now so I can get a better view. But maybe I want to say analyze compensation by education level. Like what are the salaries of the different education levels? So let's ask it that. So now I have the average salaries for different education levels. First is professional degrees, then master's degrees, bachelor's degrees, and then some college and then associate's degrees. So it's pretty expected, but GPT did that analysis for me on the fly. And again, I can select this column and say, show this column in currency format, and that'll update the column with the dollar signs and all of that. And then the final thing I'm gonna ask it is, what are some trends you can derive from this data regarding the Rust programming language? Let's see what it finds out about the Rust programming language. So it's not gonna give me a chart, but it's gonna tell me here. See what it said. From the data, here are some trends. Average compensation, developers who have worked with Rust have an average annual compensation of this much. Average years of coding experience. The average years of coding experience for Rust developers is about 14.5 years. It's not a newbie language. And then the number of respondents. There are 849 respondents who have reported working with Rust out of 10,000. So about 9%. These trends indicate that Rust developers tend to have significant coding experience and are compensated well above average. And then it also gives you some examples down here. Compare Rust and Python developers compensation or show trends for JavaScript language usage. Let's try that one out. And this will be it. So again, it's gonna show these same three things, compensation, average years of coding, number of respondents, education level distributions, and other things it wants to give you. So what I'm getting at here is ChatGPT, something that we all use, something that has matured well. It isn't perfect, but it can do data analysis on the fly, not just for things I find on Kaggle, but maybe my Google Analytics data or my company data or my finances for the year. Maybe I wanna feed that in and do some calculations that benefit my business or your business. And then, like I said about the Jupyter Notebooks, of course it's not the same, but if you come up here to the top, you can click this share chat, and then I could have a link to share the analysis that I've been doing if I wanna give a presentation or to show someone else what I've been finding. You can also come down here like I showed earlier and just download this pie chart. Maybe you just need a pie chart. You have an Excel spreadsheet, you need some quick calculations on a pie chart, just put it in GPT and download the chart. That's pretty amazing. And it's not the most cutting edge and innovative thing that we're seeing all over the news. It's a new functionality of a product that we've all been using. One that continues to mature under a useful but more simplistic use case. And a simplistic and usable AI interface that works is about all that I'm gonna really be using in my day to day now while we let all of the go-getters sort out the rest. And last of all, I would suggest subscribing to a couple of AI newsletters just to keep abreast on what's going on out there. While everyone else is out there proof of concepting everything, that doesn't give us an excuse to be in the dark about it all. Two newsletters that I particularly like are, number one, The Neuron, and number two, AI Tool Report. I'll put links below to those. Let me know what newsletters you're following or that you recommend. So what do you think about all this? What AI apps or changes have you made that are beneficial to your day-to-day -day workflow? Let me know down in the comments. I'd love to hear about it. If you found this video helpful, give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, consider doing so, and I'll see you in the next video.